Good afternoon, and welcome to the Employer Link webinar series presented by McAfee and Taft. My name is Brad Neese, Managing Editor of Employer Link. Today, our focus is once again on the Affordable Care Act. Our presentation today will walk you through a checklist for 2014 year end deadlines and help prepare you for the additional compliance challenges that lie ahead beginning in January 2015. Our panel will also discuss real world strategies for offering quality health care coverage while also managing rising costs effectively communicating with employees about health care coverage and the new exchange, identifying full-time equivalents, and dealing with large populations of part-time and variable-hour workers under the ACA. Moderating our presentation and discussion today is McAfee and Taft attorney Brandon Long, my leader of the firm's employee benefits group. He will be joined by our feature panelists, which are Angela Hopp, Assistant Director of Benefits Planning and Analysis with the University of Oklahoma, Dave Husted, Senior Vice President for Human Resources with MD Building Products, and Tina Jolly, Executive Officer for Benefits and Compensation with the Chickasaw Nation. Uh, so with those brief introductions, I now turn it over to you, Brandon. Thanks, Brad, and thanks so much, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, as always, we very much appreciate your interest and, and your time. Uh, we have a great panel for you today, a um, little different twist on a topic we've talked about a lot, the Affordable Care Act. Um, three different kind of views, three different uh, presenters here today that, that uh, are all facing different issues um, in, in their efforts to comply with the ACA. Angela from OU, and she'll talk about this at some point, um, has a very large population of part-time employees, uh, student workers, things of that nature, and has spent a great deal of time a lot of things, including helping to try to identify full-time employees uh, in this last year as we get ready for the player pay mandate coming down the pike. Um, you know, we were talking earlier, and we'll talk more about it uh, here in a little bit, that, uh, some, you know, the University of Oklahoma and even the Chickasaw Nation is an, an example of really an employer that the ACA, when it was drafted and passed, really did not... Uh, keep in mind that well because the the uh, some of the, the strategies that our private sector employers face um, and and uh, work through are are different than the what these governmental folks have to work through because the ACA really doesn't speak to them very clearly. Dave Husted is with MD Building Products. Uh, MD Building Products is a multi-state manufacturer of a lot of products you might find at Lowe's or Home Depot. I gave the example to someone earlier today that. Um, when I was putting flooring down in my house, the trim that I bought at Lowe's uh, to go between the carpet and the, the hardwood floor is was made I, by MD Building Products, um, and so and they make a lot of other things. They've been around for a long time, and uh, Dave has a a large population of employees in a lot of different places um, with various issues that he has to deal with. Tina Jolly is in charge of benefits for the Chickasaw Nation, and. In her role, as I mentioned a minute ago, she she has a an, we have a sovereign nation, a governmental entity that's like the state of Oklahoma or the United States government that has uh, very unique issues uh, that they work through in trying to deal with the ACA. You have a portion of the business that, or I mean, excuse me, a portion of the of the uh, of their work is is businesses that generate income, and you've got a population of employees that work in those businesses, and you have a portion of the employees who work for what I will call in the IRS calls kind of pure governmental operations. Um, and so that, that has created some, some issues and challenges for us uh, in the last few years. So let's go ahead and, and jump right in here. Um, for the remainder of 2014, and these first few slides are just an overview of what we will talk about here today, uh, we're going to talk about the annual fee on health insurance companies that was first applicable in 14. We're going to talk about some of the strategies our employers have are, are implementing to deal with that fee. We're going to talk about automatic enrollment uh, in health plans, which is a requirement that first kicks in in 14, or kicked in in 14 technically, but uh, we'll talk about why that has been delayed. Cost-sharing limits, reinsurance payments, which is a big um, expense or will be for a lot of our clients, and then this health plan identifier, which we have within a week, November the 5th, or a lot of our clients have a deadline to obtain uh, this health plan identifier. Um, in 2015, of course, we have the player pay mandate um, will finally be effective. A lot of folks continue to want to know if, if that's going to be delayed another year like they did last year. I think the answer is 
no. Uh, and so we, here we are 60 days out, and uh, we still definitely have clients that are working towards trying to identify full-time employees and figure out what strategy they need to implement now to comply with that, uh, considering it's just a few months away. The player pay mandate, we spent a lot of time talking about. The reporting of health insurance coverage, uh, we did a webinar on this topic. I've talked to many of you um, about this individually. This will be a, a um, at least require some time in 15. I think after we shift and move from the player pay mandate, people will have more of an appetite and interest in the reporting piece. Uh, once you start capturing the data that you'll need to report in early 2016, for the 2015 year. And then looking ahead to 2018, the, the big topic that we have not spent nearly enough time on uh, as a benefits community, largely because there's not real clear guidance, is the Cadillac tax. Very soon, very quickly, a lot of your owners, people that run your business, your boards, they will want to know uh, about the Cadillac tax and whether that, because it's a 40% non-deductible excise tax on excessively expensive health coverage. We're going to talk a little bit about that today. Okay. Um, this, the first point is this annual fee on health insurance companies. And the ACA uh, health care reform imposes an annual fee on insurance companies. Um, for 2014, the amount that they, the government hopes to collect is around $8 billion. And each, in, each insurance company's share of that is based on their net premiums written for the United States. Uh, for the previous calendar year, and it really didn't matter what this, uh, how this is calculated to you guys listening on this call. Uh, what matters is if you're fully insured. What we see is that our fully insured clients, the insurance companies, just pass this down directly to the to the client, and so it increases automatically. Even if you've had a good year from a claims perspective, when you go back through your rating process, we see those premiums still going up. Um, as your reward for having a good year because the fee on the insurance company is just being pushed down to you. Self-funded plans are not subject to this fee. What we see is that a lot of our clients who have previously been, for one reason or another, fully insured um, are now looking at being self-funded or at least thinking about it um, in order to avoid, in part, this fee and some other things. Self-funding also gives you a lot of flexibility in your plan design uh, that you don't have if you're, if you're fully insured. There's a lot of folks that historically have thought, maybe I'm too small to be self-funded, and in the past that probably was the case, but now there are lots of options out there for small, our smaller clients and smaller employers um, that may make self-funding make sense. Um, in terms of real-world strategies, um, I'm going to let Angela from OU talk about... Um, you know, the university has traditionally been fully insured, right, Angela? We have for at least the last 10 years. Yeah. And and I understand that you're moving to a more of a self-funded strategy, at least for 2015. I'd like to maybe tell us why you did that. Does this fee have anything to do with it? That is correct. We're going to go self-funded on some of our plans for 2015. And the, part of the reason for doing that is because... You know, every, like every other business, we're looking to reduce our benefits costs and still offer, you know, good benefits with choice to our employees. And so this gave us the opportunity to avoid some of those fees through the ACA and reduce the cost for both OU and the employees there. So Great. One of the questions, Angela, that people that I get, and um, I think it's helpful for others to hear it, is, you know, I think people think if you go self-funded, you have unlimited risk. Sure. I think that's a common concern, and, and the risk is always a little scary for any organization. And so the way we've approached that is we are looking at taking out plenty of stop loss. It's very important to have stop loss insurance, and a lot of people don't realize that you can purchase stop loss coverage for both individual claims, and you can also get it for, for the aggregate. And so it just depends on how much risk you feel like you can take on. Another way that we are looking to minimize the risk is to contract all of our claims adjudication and appeals process out to a third-party administrator. Great. You know, the folks, for those of you that are fully insured, uh, it's, it is, and I know that we probably talked to a lot of you about this, and it doesn't matter to us one way or the other, but we see a lot of different plans, a lot of different clients, a lot of different strategies, and some of the cost-saving strategies that Dave and Jean, or Tina will talk about at some later uh, here in a bit, 
uh, they're not even available to you if you're fully insured. I mean, direct contracting, uh, some of the things like that um, are not available to you if you are fully insured. And so we'll talk about those here in a little bit, but I think self-funding really gives you a lot more control over your plan than, than you would have if you are if you're fully insured. Okay. Um, starting in 2014, the ACA amended the Fair Labor Standards Act to require certain large employers to automatically enroll their new full-time employees in uh, the employer's health plan, and then also to continue the enrollment of current employees. Um, the automatic enrollment um, provision technically kicked in in 2014, and it would apply to employers that are subject to the Fair Labor Standards Act have more than 200 full-time employees, and have one or more health plans. The interesting piece of this is even though this is an example of even though this requirement kicked in in 2014 under the ACA, they have, the regulators have not issued regulations yet, and so we, they have delayed the effective date of this. I put this in here to remind us that it's there. A lot of our clients have an automatic enrollment feature in their retirement benefit plan to encourage people to save uh, for retirement and plan ahead, this is going to be a similar concept where you will give someone a notice saying you have the right to opt out of, of our health plan, but if you do not opt out, we will automatically enroll you, and to the extent it costs money, uh, that money will come out of your check. So um, in terms of it's effective now, I ask, are you complying? Um, most of you would say, and rightfully say, so no, because we don't know what we need to comply with yet. Um, the other, there's lots of open issues that I don't know that the, the legislators really thought through when they passed the, the statute, and I think the regulators are struggling with some very basic questions, like, for example, what do you have to enroll them in? Do you enroll an employee, a full-time employee, automatically in uh, employee-only coverage, or if it's Brandon Long and Brandon and Joanna have four kids, do you have to enroll the whole family? Um, another question that is common that we're not sure how it will play out is, how does it affect the cafeteria plan? Do you automatically enroll them in the cafeteria plan also? And if so, is that okay? Um, so there, there will be future guidance that comes out on automatic enrollment. We don't have it yet. I don't think we'll have it anytime soon. But for those of you listening, it's just something that we need to uh, keep in mind. Okay. Healthcare reform requires that cost sharing be limited. And there's an overall limit on uh, cost sharing or an out-of-pocket maximum. Um, this applies to essential health benefits, does not apply to our grandfather health plans, but this is a limitation on the out-of-pocket spend uh, by an employee on deductibles, co-insurance, co-payments, and similar charges. It does not include premiums. We're not talking about the amount you can charge your employees in terms of a premium. It do does not include balanced billing for non-network providers, uh, or spending for non-covered services. This is only this is a non-grandfathered health plan, and a limitation on the out-of-pocket maximum for certain out-of-pocket uh, um, spends. Um, the in 2014, the limitation is basically sixty-three six thousand three hundred fifty dollars for self-only coverage, and twelve thousand seven hundred dollars for family coverage. This amount is adjusted each year by HHS. They've indicated that for 2015, the maximum out-of-pocket limit will be $6,600 for self-only coverage and $13,200 for coverage other than self-only coverage. Um, it's important, you know, a lot of, I hear, I hear others talk on this, and you, you'll, they'll say correctly that right now it's tied to the limitation on uh, the limits for self-only and family coverage for HSA-compatible high-deductible health plans. That the tie-in to those amounts for 2014, they were exactly the same as these numbers you see on your slide there. Starting in 2015, those numbers will be different because they are, they are not the same thing and they're not tied together. You have different regulators setting those limitations. So, again, 2015, it's $6,600 for self-only coverage and then $13,200 for coverage other than self-only coverage. One of the questions that we also seem to get a lot of is, Okay, last year in 2014, uh, or this year, I guess, uh, in 2014, uh, if you had a separately administered medical plan and a separately administered different ad administration uh, for your prescription drug, for example, um, 
you could have a separate 6350 limit for each of those and not violate uh, this rule. And this that was a special safe harbor they gave us for one year only. I've been in health consultant meetings where the health consultant is telling them they're allowed to continue doing that in 2015 and going forward, and that is not correct. So that safe harbor has, is gone after 2014. And to the extent your consultant has told you otherwise, you go back and say that either Brandon doesn't know what he's talking about or Brandon said this and tell us why why we're okay. So uh, it is a out-of-pocket limitation, and it's combined medical and prescription drug for 15 and going forward, and I think it will continue to be that way. Okay, in terms of, you know, we get, I get hung up on all of the nerdy details of all of these rules and, and how they, it's kind of a moving target and trying to explain nuances of, of various things. Really what people are interested in is, I find, is how do we save money? And what are some of the strategies that are being used to save costs? Do we, you know, increase deductibles and co-pays? I think, by the way, that in increasing your deductibles and your co-pays is a fine strategy. I actually think it's important to do that. I'm not a health consultant, but I think it's important to do that because what I see is that our employers, who are gen- even McAfee and Taft, if we're very generous to our employees and we want to keep those things low, as the costs continue to rise, going from almost a no out-of-pocket spend by an employee to something more in market is hard for our employees to swallow. So it's good to periodically be increasing that those amounts even marginally just so that your employees see that the costs are going up, not just for the employer, but also for them on an individual basis. Um, I'd like for Dave to start out talking about maybe some of the strategies that MD Building Products has implemented and is implementing now on an ongoing basis to help save costs. And, uh, again, MD is a multi-state manufacturer, and they are a, they have a self-funded health plan. So, Dave, would you mind talking about that? Absolutely. Uh, so I think the first thing that uh, we recognize is that uh, your health plan, similar to a, a, a toddler, is something you can't turn your back on for a moment. It's something you have to pay attention to every day, uh, all year long. Um, so we began in the beginning of this year uh, with an education campaign and, and very aggressively set about getting in front of all employees and educating them around how we utilize our benefits and how that drives costs. Uh, certainly some of the other things on this list, increasing deductibles and co-pays, um, were things that needed to be done, and I agree Brandon, they serve to demonstrate that costs are rising on both sides of the equation, but the fact that there are two sides to the equation is something that we needed to educate our employees around in in addition to to many other things. So uh, beginning by getting in front of groups and explaining um, the realities of what we're facing, um, how things are changing. Uh, we we implemented a strategy, uh, used an analogy uh, with our employees that was very effective to help them see how this works even within their own personal life, where if you find that your cost for your car insurance is increasing uh, due to accidents or, or moving violations or whatever the case may be, you're likely to pull your family around the table and talk about how we need to drive more safely, we need to follow the rules of the road, and and what are those behaviors that you are going to change that will impact the cost of your insurance ultimately? Um, some of the, you know, sometimes in the long term, sometimes in, in the short term. So we really, uh, again, aggressively educated employees around how their behaviors help to either decrease or increase costs. Um, and some of those additional items that we educated employees around and help them understand um, their behavior in terms of utilizing direct contracts, uh, utilizing providers that we have direct contracts with, um, actively participating in the wellness program, uh, how, how that would help to keep the, the cost manageable or at least try to get, get a rope around them and, and keep them where they are. Um, direct contracts is, was a very beneficial strategy for us, and we have direct contracts in place, one with a wellness partner who is in a position to collect health data 
on our employees through our wellness program. The wellness program consists of biometric screenings, um, a disease uh, management process, uh, and also a uh, tobacco cessation uh, piece of the program. And, and that's about data. That's about collecting health data and health risk data on your employees and implementing a proactive outreach uh, program, again, through the wellness partner um, to contact those employees who have an opportunity to uh, employ new strategies, change their behaviors in such a way that they could positively impact their overall health picture. Um, working with the pharmacy benefit manager to implement something like a step therapy process was also a, a big strategy for us because prior to that, uh, we did not pay a lot of attention to what was on the formulary, what the costs associated with that were. Tell us, Dave, what is a, tell us what step therapy is. So step therapy is taking certain drugs and certain drug strategies and um, encouraging and, and I, hate, I hate to use the term uh, force, there's probably a better term, but um, providing an opportunity for the employee to try out a lower cost alternative and to allow them to give feedback on when working with their physician. Um, to give feedback to the pharmacy benefit manager on how that lower-cost alternative is working for them. And if they believe that it is not working the way that they would like it to, then we will step them up to the next level of generic, for example, um, assuming that there are multiple levels. Ultimately, um, the employee may come to the conclusion that they want to go back to the, the brand name drug that they were on if it is still available. Um, but in many cases, what we found is that employees were very happy with their own personal savings uh, on the lower cost alternative. And in most cases, they were very happy with how, um, how it treated their particular issue. You know, one thing, um, Dave mentioned the direct contracting, and, and I started out and I didn't finish my thought. Um, that increasing deductibles and co-pays is fine for the reason and important for the reasons we talked about. But really, you go to these meetings and you listen to these employers and their consultants talk about their where they're spending money. It's on the claims, and so finding ways to reduce claims is a big deal. And if you can, to the extent that you can structure it, your plan, and your, if you're self-funded, and again, if you're fully insured, you may not have some of these opportunities, which again is a reason to think about maybe being self-funded going forward. Um, but if you if, if you can structure your plan in a way so that you can say, Brandon, as an employee of McAfee, if you go to provider X for an orthopedic surgery, let's say, you have no deductible and no copay as to that provider. And then you have a deal with the provider. The plan has a contract with the provider directly, and it's, it's got to be done right because some of your network, you may violate your network contracts if it's not structured properly. But... Um, then the, the spend from the employer to that provider is cheaper, so you have a negotiated cheaper rate so that if they go to that, that provider, not only is it cheaper for them individually, but it will save your health plan big dollars, especially on a cumulative basis. And then the, the – um, so that if – and you've got to implement strategies to get them to those providers and to educate them. There's a whole component of that here, too. Um, so you, you, if you've got direct contracts, you've got to make sure that, that people are actually – taking advantage of them. And so you, one thing I would say on the, the wellness strategy that Dave mentioned is your wellness programs are, it's, it's really important that you structure them right and that you work with people that help you make sure you're dotting your I's and crossing your T's because there are a lot of legal issues currently with wellness programs, not problems, but just, just uh, you've got to comply with HIPAA non-discrimination rules when you structure your wellness program. And I, even just today, I saw that the, uh, another lawsuit had been filed by the EEOC against another employer challenging the wellness program under the Americans with Disabilities Act. And so that's something we've got to think about going forward. The EEOC, unfortunately, has not given us any guidance and, on how they feel about wellness programs. And now they've filed three different lawsuits in different parts of the country challenging those programs. 
And a lot of our, I can tell you, I don't ever talk to a client, we wouldn't work with a client, but I never talk to a client that says, you know, we want to do something that's in violation of the law. But when we don't even know what the rules are, it's hard to comply with the rules. You know what I mean? So it, it, we're going to have to be real careful about and make sure your wellness programs, what it looks like, by the way, in these wellness cases that they're challenging is if, if the strategy is if you don't sign up for the wellness program, you're fired or you have to pay all the premium yourself. These are far different than what Dave is talking about uh, to manage costs. And another uh, area that you've got to pay attention to or something to look out for is to not set up your wellness program so that an employee has to achieve a certain um, a, a certain level within the program. For example, they don't they get the discount for getting the screening done, not because their cholesterol was below X level. Yeah. Um, and, and I think it's poor, important to recognize that just having people do screenings and find out what their overall health picture is changes behaviors as a standalone process. Uh, but then to have a an outreach in place that uh, identifies anyone who is at a high risk for a health issue through the screening process and having the doctors and nurses that are there at the, at the wellness partner reaching out to those employees to help them take steps two and three in the process is very important. Yes, absolutely. And, and you know, the um, uh, one of the thing I might, might mention is um, our tobacco programs even, they, you know, a lot of the, I just this morning had a discussion with someone, a client about it, their tobacco program. And it, you certify during open enrollment that you are or are not a tobacco user. And if you say, yes, I am, you still can get the discount if you participate in the cessation program. And even at the end of that program, if you're still smoking, you still get the discount as long as you've participated in the program. So um, there are different kinds of wellness strategies. You might say, I thought this was an ACA seminar. Why are we talking about wellness? Well, the ACA um, changed the rules dealing with wellness programs, number one. Number two, the very last portion of our discussion today is on the Cadillac tax. I think we will all see that a lot of the discussion in the next few years about how to avoid the Cadillac tax is having an effective wellness program. So it's, it all kind of fits together. The other thing that I would say, and then I'm going to ask for Tina's input uh, on another aspect of this, the farm, Dave mentioned the pharmacy spend, and, and Tina can even talk about that too. Uh, folks, a lot of your plans are spending a lot of money on drugs, and there are and, and there's a lot of, I don't want to sound like there's anything wrong going on or improper or anything, but there's a lot of dead bodies buried there in terms of dollars you're spending on pharmacy. And so strategies to, to kind of have people try drug, you know, a certain drug um, and before they go to a more expensive one, I see a lot of consultants recommending to folks like Dave and, and Tina and Angela that kind of a, a strategy. So, Tina, uh, one of the things that, you know, I'd like for you to talk about kind of culturally um, some of the obstacles that you have faced, and I know that from looking at our attendance list, we have other Native American employers on this in this discussion today or on this call. And what are some of the, the challenges that you faced in implementing a wellness pro- strategy? And then maybe what are kind of some of the baby steps you've been able to implement to get you headed in the right direction? Okay, I think um, some of the first things we need to look at when talking about a tribal government is that one thing that's very unique about them is that many of their employees are, in fact, tribal citizens of that nation. And most um, tribal organizations that I'm familiar with are very mission-driven. For the Chickasaw Nation, our mission is to improve the quality of life of Chickasaw people. And we value all of our employees as a family. We call ourselves the Chickasaw family. And so it's very important for us to maintain a very rich and robust benefits package for all of our employees that allows them a lot of flexibility and autonomy for choice. Some of the things that we have done are we we changed up our plan design. It it literally changed from a 90-10 to an 80-20. We updated our contribution schedule so our employees are are paying a little more out of pocket. When I say a little more, it's baby steps. It's very conservative in our areas. Um, Our our deductibles and co-pays are still not as high as what people's were, other other plans were previously. Um, this year, moving forward, we placed a huge emphasis on case management, disease management, and lifestyle management programs. 
We've also leveraged our wellness program, which we've tied to our employee bonuses, to the lifestyle management program. Um, we also have um, began a step therapy program in our pharmacy benefit. And one of the biggest things where we found there was un- out-of-control spending was with compound drugs. Literally, within the last couple of years, we had spent over $3 million on compounds. And so we really decided that when we, when we spoke with our TPA across their book of business and most of their other uh, self-funded plans, compounding was something that was no longer covered. And so we have literally removed most of those um, high-cost powders that were being used in, um, we'll say, boutique-type pharmacies. So the ph- is the pharmacist making the, the, the drug, basically? Literally, that's what they're doing. They're taking different ingredients that they've ordered, and it's kind of getting to a, a, a boutique-type um, system where a physician can say, okay, well, let's mix one, two, and three drugs together. And really, that's something that's not overseen by the FDA. And so as a consumer, we don't know if we're getting actually 100% of what on the label is in that in that medication, and most of the time they're extremely expensive. Mm-hmm. And there's still there's still some compounds that some clients want to cover, like there's some children's compounds, right? Absolutely. What we did was we eliminated all of the high cost um, bulk powders that were being used. What we allowed was a three hundred dollar limit. Because we know there's lots of kids, if you're trying to get them to take medicine, it has to taste good. And so we still allow that for for your pharmacist to make, add add a flavoring to make it taste good so your children will take it. Also, um, hormone therapy, we still allow that. I mean, I think as a woman it's important that we kind of keep us all on an even keel. And so um, we allow hormone therapy. Um, And then one other area, uh, we found that a lot of people, if you're having severe nausea or, or vomiting, a Finergan gel that you can that you can rub on your wrist. And so those are just three areas that, that we were really considering, but we've placed a limit on it, and um, I think that's going to cut that spin down to next to nothing, literally. Um, also, we put a big emphasis on the drugs that are run through medical, your medical billing. And so a lot of folks, if you're not aware of this, a lot of these are infusions that are given in the medical provider's office. He's getting them for he or she's getting them from whatever wholesaler they and they can charge your medical plan literally whatever they want. So we're working with our TPA to run those through um, and really put an active case management program on that to save literally. I, I believe it will be thousands this next year that we'll save on that. We also, as part of our education campaign and our education strategy, because the changes in our environment. Even small ones are very significant. We felt like it was very important that we educated um, from the top down. So we developed a class that's called Insurance 101 that explains basic terminology for your medical plan. What's a deductible? What's in network? What's out of network? How do I read my EOB? What does preauthorization mean? And we've literally... We're teaching them how to go on to, to our TPA's website to where they can literally become a better consumer because it's very transparent. You can look at if you need a, an ACL repair. You can literally go out and look at the different facilities within a, a certain geographic region, and it will tell you, based upon our plan, what, what your out-of-pocket cost will be. And so when they are looking to see that they can get that surgery or for an MRI, For instance, if you go to a freestanding imaging center, the cost is going to be about one-third of what it would be if you went to a a medical center, for example. And so we we literally, since we've started that class, we've seen a shift in people's behaviors. Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks, Tina. That's excellent. And I guess the... the, yeah, I, I know that the, the savings on these strategies is significant. I mean, projected yes. to be. Some of them are immediate saving strategies. Right. Others, a wellness is a more of a long-term play. Right. And I think that's important to know about some of these. It's uh, Some you can really pull the lever immediately. Others, you're, you're pulling the lever for the long term. And so it's kind of a combination of strategies. And it, if, you, if you've got a self-funded plan, you've got the ability to pull a lot of different levers. It just depends on your tolerance for each of these. 
One thing I would just as a kind of a real world example for our law firm, you know, forever McAfee and Taft has provided very generous benefits, health benefits especially to its employees, and we don't charge premiums. We've not charged a premium uh, for our employees. I have, I'm probably the worst consumer of health coverage in the firm. I have six people on the, our health plan, me, my wife, and our four kids, and I pay nothing in terms of a premium. Uh, so, we, you know, here I'm telling you guys you need to raise your costs, and McAfee and Taft, we, it still didn't cost anything. We, at some point, we need to get in line. But one of the strategies that we have taken that we felt uh, we could do is we had, you know, some concerns about spouses, and I get a lot of questions about spouses being on health plans and the cost of that because, as you know, under the player pay rules, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, you're not required to offer uh, health coverage to a spouse under the ACA, just to dependents, in order to avoid the penalties. Um, but what we said basically is that if you're, if a spouse has, if an employee's spouse has coverage available through his or her employer, uh, they can stay on the McAfee plan, but they have to pay a premium, an, ex- an extra, a, a, an extra amount for it. And, um, I, I know I'm aware of other clients, uh, other employers who say if the spouse has coverage available through their employer, they're not eligible at all for the health plan. And that's a fine strategy, but that's not, we felt like that was kind of too far, and we still wanted to give our employees the choice. And even that, even for us as a law firm, that small change um, has helped, And but it was also very difficult to communicate and explain, and we, we had some, some kind of uh, difficult discussions with our folks trying to implement those strategies. Dave, what, in terms of communication strategies, how do you... Do you have any thoughts on how you best communicate some of these to people to help them understand what's why you're doing it? Well, absolutely. Just to highlight some of the strategies that we've put in place over the past year, and uh, you know, I think the first thing that you can say is that you can't be creative enough when it comes to how to get in front of your uh, employees and communicate to them. Um, for us, it begins in the beginning of the year during open enrollment where we uh, get in front of all employees face-to-face in, in group sessions um, where we present information that literally has never been presented before. In the interest of um, as much transparency as possible, we, if, if, if we're a family and we're all in this together, then we all need to understand what we're dealing with. And so um, that, that's a little bit of, uh, around what we're communicating, but in terms of how it begins with those group sessions, and then we will put a sign-up sheet in the back of the room, and anybody who wants to do a one-on-one follow-up based off of the information that they just heard in the group meeting will sit down and review their personal benefits picture, being careful to not you know, mandate their choices, obviously, but to give them as much information as we can give them um, to make an informed decision. Um, and then it goes back to my comment about not turning your back on this for uh, for a minute. And so the communication strategies continue year-round. And, again, we don't feel like we can ever get to the point where we're being too creative with how we communicate. We've established boards specifically um, dedicated to communicating benefits information. Um, we are uh, utilizing um, our, our common areas. Uh, in the facilities to put out communications, to put posters up on the wall, to put table tents on the cafeteria tables. We're doing direct mailings out to employees' uh, homes with information that they need to know. Um, We're staying as real-time on communications as we can as we look at the data and as we see trends happening. um, And we realize that there is a, a behavior or a set of behaviors that are driving a trend We'll educate, we'll communicate and put together um, educational pieces that we'll send, uh, we'll start with leadership and educate them on it and then work with them and their employees to make sure that everyone is getting um, that consistent communication. Thanks, Dave. Okay, next uh, thing we're going to talk about is the reinsurance fee. Most folks are aware of this. Um, I want to. We wanted to put this in here to highlight a couple of quick things Starting in for a, the reinsurance fee is a three-year fee, 2014, 15, and 16. It's calculated on a calendar year basis, and it, you know for our clients, especially you know like right now, our self-funded clients are looking at figuring out what this reinsurance fee looks like. If you're fully insured, it's just being passed down to you through your insurance company. 
Um, but if you're self-funded, then this is a fee you will have to calculate and make a payment to the government for. Uh, just last week, working with a group wanting to know if the retiree-only coverage is subject to the reinsurance fee. You know, a lot of our clients have a, a kind of active employee plan, and then they also have a retiree-only plan. And the answer is retiree coverage is generally subject to the reinsurance fee, just like your active employee plan is. Um, the reinsurance contributions are made for all reinsurance contribution enrollees, which includes employees and dependents. I like to say when I'm talking about this, the reinsurance fee is calculated on a belly button basis, and so it's a $63 times the number of belly buttons. The average number of lives during the applicable year, which, again, is the, the calendar year, and here most immediately, 2014. Um, the HHS, I mentioned that the, the reinsurance fee for 2014 is $63 annually or five and a quarter a month. HHS has announced that the rate for next year is $44, so it will go down for 2015, and hopefully we'll see that same trend uh, for 2016. The reinsurance fee is, is made, the payment is made annually. There are several methods for counting the number of lives that are subject to the fee. You have three methods, basically, an actual method uh, where you basically look at your actual count of employees between or enrollees between January and September, a snapshot method where you take a snapshot at certain times, and then a method based on the number of, of uh, folks that you're reporting on your Form 5500. It doesn't matter which one you use. You have a choice. Um, you can – one thing that is kind of a key takeaway and, and – a lot of folks listening to this are probably saying, well, I already know this. Why are we talking about it? A lot of people, though, still, we still get or still talking to a lot of people about this November 15th deadline. If you have a self-funded health plan and it is, um, uh, we, we're here two weeks out from the November 15th deadline, which is the date where you need to report to the government your account. And um, so that make sure your consultant is helping you with that or is at least uh, giving you a heads up on it. If they haven't, that's okay. Just make sure that you, you don't miss that. And they may be planning to do it already, just haven't communicated. But that was something I would reach out and ask because this could be fairly significant dollars. Contributions are, can be paid in two installments. Um, and basically the, um, um, the first installment, would the way it works is you're going to report in the, by November 15th of, of this year, your count based on that January to September uh, data, you will get, you'll submit that November 15th within a, by, I think by December the 15th, they're going to give you a, an invoice. The government will send you a bill, and then you have within 30 days after that invoice, so in our situation, you would have until G, sometime in January 15th to actually make the payment. The first piece of the payment, um, is you know there's a it's a sixty three dollar fee fifty two dollars and fifty cents of that is the the part that you're going to be responsible for in January of fifteen and that actually that is actually the reinsurance piece of this there's another component we kind of refer to it all together as the reinsurance fee but actually it's two pieces one is a reinsurance contribution uh, and second is some sort of a payment to the U S Treasury the second piece of the payment the parts of the U S Treasury which is the other Ten dollars and fifty cents um, is paid later in the year. You'll get an invoice in uh, December of fourteen, and that will be payable um, later this year. Um, what else do we want to talk about? I think that is enough on on the reinsurance uh, fee and how that is calculated. One thing that I wanted to ask, you know, just in terms of a real world, this is these are real dollars. And when I first calculated it for the the firm's uh, plan, I thought. Man, this could be a lot of money. I'm curious, to Tina. Maybe you can share, if you don't mind, what we're, uh, you know, what the nation has found in terms of what the reinsurance fee might be, because you've got a large population of people. Right. Looking at our current covered population, it, for 2014, it will cost us over 1.1 million. Wow, big dollars. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Um, health plan identifier. This is the the I mentioned this already. Um, if you are a large health plan which is a plan that has uh, basically more than $5 million in annual receipts, and your consultant can help you figure that out. You have to have a health plan identifier, a number. You just need to log on and obtain that, or there's a process actually you go through 
to obtain that, and you need to do that by November the 5th, which is um, next week sometime. And then if you're a small plan, you've got an additional year. That just wanted to make you aware of that because that is a fairly immediate deadline. And I know, again, from the calls we've been getting, that that is something that, that uh, not everyone has, has done yet. Okay, 2015, we're not going to spend a ton of time on this because we've, we've done multiple webinars on the player pay mandate. And you can listen, by the way, to any of our webinars uh, for free by getting onto our website, including the ones we've done this year on the player pay. But as you know, the ACA basically has two different penalties that an employer, a large employer, could be subject to. One is a $2,000 penalty for failing to offer coverage at all. The other is a $3,000 penalty the penalty you pay if you offer coverage, but the coverage isn't very good because it's not affordable or it does not provide minimum value. These penalties are only triggered, um, as most of you know, they're only triggered if an employee goes to the exchange and based on their income levels qualifies for a subsidy or a tax credit. And so it's it's not an automatic kind of deal, but they, they go into effect here uh, within 60 days or so. In 2015, they've given us a couple of... Uh, nice little rules that basically said if you're a large employer and you have less than 100 full-time employees, you have a pass on the, uh, the, the big piece of the penalty, the $2,000 penalty for not offering coverage at all for 2015 only. You could still be subject to that other smaller penalty for not offering coverage that's very good. Um, for, for 2015, if you're a large employer, all three of the folks, uh, our clients that are participating here today in this discussion are large, and so they have an obligation to, well, not an obligation, they have a choice to offer coverage to 70% of their full-time employees and their dependents um, or pay the penalty in 2015. So for 2015, if you have 100 or more full-time employees, instead of offering coverage to 95% of those to avoid the big penalty, you only have to offer coverage to 70%, and that 70% will go back to 95% in 2016. In terms of uh, what you should be doing now, um, if you have a non-calendar year plan year, you need to think through whether this applies to you as of January 1 or as of the first day of your plan year in 2015. You need to know what measurement period you're using to identify your full-time employees. If you have, you know, Dave does not have part-time employees, and so not a big issue for him, but I know the University of Oklahoma has a lot of part-time employees and seasonal employees and so forth and so on. And so if you have those populations, you need to understand what your measurement period is and who, how you're identifying and tracking your full-timers. Angela, why don't you, if you don't mind, tell us a little bit about some of the challenges the University of Oklahoma faced and faces in identifying full-time employees and maybe some of the strategies you've implemented to, to identify them. Sure. We knew that when the, when the final regs came out back in February that this was going to be a huge undertaking for us, having both an academic medical center and then a traditional campus in Norman. There were a lot of different types of employment relationships. And so we worked closely with our legal team there at OU, human resources. We worked with an outside consultant as well. And then we thought it was very important to pull in the different departments, the different groups on all of the campuses so that we could understand what types of employees they had there. And so we worked, uh, we worked very collaboratively through the summer with, with all of these groups to identify who was out there. And we developed, I guess, kind of a guidebook for our, our campuses to use so that they could understand what the background was of this. We explained the measurement period to them. And then we, um, we, ex- we came up with a matrix that shows the different types of employment relationships that we have and what we currently do for those groups and what will, what will be required in 2015 to provide an easy-ish, I guess, if you will, way for these people to identify and track their employees. And so we've, we've gone out now. We're in the middle of a, a communications rollout, primarily on our Norman campus. We did health sciences earlier, and we're going out and we're talking to the departments and giving them an opportunity to ask questions. And as we go through that process, it's, it's always interesting because there's, there's always something new to think about. You know, there's, there's a new uh, twist to the whole thing that comes up, and so it gives us an opportunity to go back and refine what our processes are as we go through. And, Angela, I know from those meetings that 
when you get those different folks in a room together mm-hmm. from different that are doing different things in different divisions, you identify employees you didn't even know you had, right? There, there's, there are a lot of different employees out there, and one of the things that, that we thought about as we engaged the campus and what we were doing is just to be you know, cognizant of the fact that you don't know what you don't know. And when you go out and you start talking to all of these groups, you realize, you know, how much is out there that that's going on, that it's, you know, it's virtually impossible to keep up with all of it until you get out and you engage these employee groups. And I mentioned this at the beginning, the University of Oklahoma, the Chickasaw Nation, I know that there's some staffing companies that are listening to this call. The university is an example of a... Of a uh, and educational institutions in general are an example of a piece of the, that the ACA really is, didn't didn't address very well, and and so you have lots of you have a, you have certain employees who it, maybe it's not easy to identify how many hours they get paid for. You know, you have people that are teaching classes. The adjuncts are fairly easy because mm-hmm. the, the ACA gave us good guidance, but in terms of what about our our graduate assistants who are teaching, or maybe they get a stipend for, and, and is, does that count in terms of hourly pay? Those are some of the things Angela and her team had to work through. What would you suggest, you know, here we are 60 days out. I don't want anybody on this call to go away panicked and to think, oh, my gosh, I haven't done any of that, and here we are, we got 60 days out. What would you suggest in terms of how you get your arms around your problem? I think the first thing that, that I would suggest people to, to do is to sit down and just, you know, the HRIS, HRIS system that they have, I'm sure, is going to pull all these different codes and job codes. People need to look at all of the different types of employment relationships that they have, and then I would, I would encourage them to go out and talk to department heads to further get a grasp on, on what they're dealing with and then just start from there. And one thing that was really helpful for us was to sit down and do this matrix because that gives you a chance to put it on paper and really see what you have, and you can you can go from there, and it makes it a little bit easier to carve that path. One thing I would say to you folks listening is that keep in mind that you do have a seventy. If you're if you have a hundred more than a hundred full time employees, you have a seventy percent wiggle room rule for 2015. So don't panic. You, that's going to help you avoid because uh, a lot of our clients avoid. They offer coverage to seventy percent of their full time employees already. It's identifying those that might slip through the cracks, and uh, that will help you avoid the, the big penalty. And then the other piece is is that what I see is a lot of folks who are really panicked about this, or maybe they haven't given it the attention that they would like to because they've been busy with other things, is if you look at the income levels of your employee population, it's unlikely that a lot of your employees might will qualify for the subsidy or the tax credit on the exchange, uh, and so therefore they would never trigger a penalty. So... Your, in terms of your exposure, it's, it, it's often less than I think what a lot of our, our folks see to begin with. But I think Angela is right, getting your team together, identifying all those codes of what employment relationships you have, understanding better who those people are, where your part-timers, your seasonal employees are, if you have staffing relationships, who's the employer of those employees. Getting your arms around that now, is, is, it's definitely not too late, and there, there are other strategies that, that you can implement to try to, to – uh, get moving forward, even if, if you're just getting started. Okay, 2015, we've got the employer reporting rules that uh, kick in, and this is where you're starting in January of 15, you're, you will need to start capturing data that's going to be reported both to the IRS and to your employees. And so um, this reporting will take place in first quarter of 2016, and it will be for the 2015 year. So you kind of have a month-by-month collection of data in 2015 here just a few months away that you need certain data you need to be capturing so that you can report it in early 2016. This is maybe difficult for you to see. It's kind of hard for me to see it as I put it up there. Uh, But it's a, you know, we've got the, the IRS has given us some draft forms. The reporting forms are not in final form yet, but we think they're pretty close. We don't think they're going to change much. They've issued these draft forms and some draft instructions to go along with them. And honestly, what we've been doing is we've been having just maybe lunch over the phone with, with folks and um, kind of walking through these forms and showing the data you're going to have to capture. Because as I look more at it, it's important that you start, that you're aware of it and you know what you're going to need to start capturing in January 15. It's really not that bad. The biggest pieces of this that I still 
get some people complaining about are the Social Security numbers of a dependent. Not everybody has that uh, for some reason, and everybody's different. Um, but that's a, that's a big deal. And then making sure you know how many employees you have, how many are full-time on a month-by-month basis. And so that's kind of what you, what you need. Um, and that's this next slide. I kind of jumped ahead, but big picture, you, big picture, you need to know how many employees do you have, how many of them are full-time employees, who's offered health coverage and who's not on a month-by-month basis, who's enrolled, who's not, and what are they paying. And there's some special nuances to, the, to what I just said, but that's generally what you're capturing. The big thing, again, a lot of folks already have what I just mentioned. big thing, again, is the Social Security numbers of the dependents. And, you know, I, I see a lot of payroll providers and vendors selling different software and tools to help our clients track this kind of data, and those are all fine. Um, but some of them are fairly expensive, and so I might, if it was me, I might give it a shot on my own with the existing tools that I have um, and try to capture the data myself um, or internally, at least, with your financial folks. The same people that do your W-2s will likely be coordinating with HR to kind of capture this data and report it. Um, but, Dave, do you have any thoughts on what you've seen recently with your payroll vendor? Certainly. We... Uh recently upgraded our payroll and HR information system, um, and it includes assistance with this reporting requirement. So I feel very fortunate in that, but also in talking to my peers out there in the community, there are those that um, didn't realize that they could leverage their relationship with whoever provides that platform for them, even if it's not provided uh, Immediately, uh, they are often working on a solution and are getting ready to provide a solution. So um, many of my colleagues have uh, bypassed some of those standalone high-cost products that are out there by leveraging their relationship with their, uh, their current provider. Great. Last topic is the Cadillac tax. Again, folks, we will spend a lot more time. I'm sure we will do additional webinars on this topic uh, in the years to come. We need to be aware of it now because it, it could be fairly significant. I'm, you know, I, I worry about even our own our firm's health plan whether this is something something we need to be worried about. But it's basically uh, for tax years after 2017, if there will be a 40 percent non-deductible excise tax on high health high cost health coverage. This is often referred to as the Cadillac tax. Um, in addition to raising revenue, the tax is intended conceptually to reduce demand for high-cost coverage by making the coverage simply more expensive, so with some disincentive financially for people to use the coverage, which is kind of against the way a lot of, of us in, in this community um, think. The, co- the question is, you know, how is it calculated? How do you determine if you're subject to the tax? And, and we know the amount is 40% of the, the excess benefit, um, and the question is, well, what is the excess benefit amount? Um, basically, this tax will be calculated or looked at on a month-by-month basis, and it will be the employee's, the employee's excess amount will be for a month. The amount by which the cost of the employee's coverage for that month exceeds one-twelfth of the annual limit for that particular year. And um, we think right now this looks like one you know, $10,200 for self-only coverage, $27,500 for coverage other than self-only coverage. You divide those amounts by 12, and by the way, those amounts will go up and be adjusted periodically, but you divide the amounts I just mentioned by 12, and if the cost of the employee's coverage for a month exceeds what one-twelfth of those amounts are, you will pay 40% non-deductible excise tax. And as we move forward and the regulators issue additional regulations, uh, we will know more about this. We'll be able to tell you more than I was just able to tell you right there. I, I'm not a big fan. of. We've been at this, all of us, for long enough now, for going on for almost five years. Um, we could spend a lot of time telling you to, to, uh, what, the, what the statute says and what we don't know. The regulations could come out and say comp- something completely different because the regulators don't seem... At times, they pick and choose what they follow the statute on and, and what, what they don't. So but, uh, just want you to know it's there. What you should be doing now, cost-saving strategies that we talked about earlier, that's what you should be doing now. You need to look at ways to reduce your health costs, whether it's wellness strategies or 
you know, claims control. You need to look at ways to reduce your costs going forward because it will impact whether you're subject to or trigger this tax, this Cadillac tax, uh, in 2018 and forward. I want to thank Angela Hopp, David Husted, Tina Jolly, and Brandon Long for presenting today's webinar. And on behalf of the law firm of Maxby and Taft, thank you for joining us for another Employer Link webinar. See you next time and have a great afternoon. <laughs>